Section 7 of The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta. Translation by Samuel Lee. Chapter 16. Ibn Battuta arrives at the Queen Mother's Palace, his daughter's death and funeral, the Emperor's return to Delhi, appoints Ibn Battuta judge of Delhi, character of the Emperor, quarrels with the inhabitants of Delhi, and commands them to quit the city for Dalatabad, Emir of Fargana put to death, the Kazai Jalal Odan and others put to death, cruelties of the Emperor, Arabic panegyric composed by our traveller for him, in danger of losing his life, gives up his office, and joins the religious. Let us now return to the description of our arrival in Delhi. When we arrived at this place, the vizier having previously met us, we came to the door of the sultan's harem, to the place in which his mother, El Makduma Jahan, resides, the vizier, as also the kezai of the place, being still with us. These paid their respects at the entrance, and we all followed their example. We also, each of us, sent his present to her, which was proportionate to his circumstances. The queen's secretaries then registered these presents, and informed her of them. The presents were accepted, and we were ordered to be seated. Her viands were then brought in. We received the greatest respect and attention in their odd way. After this, dresses of honor were put upon us, and we were ordered to withdraw to such places as had been prepared for each of us. We made our obeisance and retired accordingly. This service is presented by one's bowing the head, placing one of the hands on the earth, and then retiring. When I had got to the house prepared for me, I found it furnished with every carpet, vessel, couch, and fuel one could desire. The victuals which they brought us consisted of flour, rice, and flesh, all of which were brought from the mother of the emperor. Every morning we paid our respects to the vizier, who on one occasion gave me two thousand dinars, and said, This is to enable you to get your clothes washed. He also gave me a large robe of honor, and to my attendants, who amounted to about forty, he gave two thousand dinars. After this, the emperor's allowance was brought to us, which amounted to the weight of one thousand daily rittles of flour, where every rittle is equal to five and twenty rittles of Egypt. We also had one thousand rittles of flesh, and of fermented liquors, oil, oil olive, and the betel nut, many riddles, and also many of the betel leaf. During this time, and in the absence of the emperor, a daughter of mine happened to die, which the vizier communicated to him. The emperor's distance from Delhi was that of ten stages. Nevertheless, the vizier had an answer from him on the morning of the day on which the funeral was to take place. His orders were that what was usually done on the death of any of the children of the nobility should be done now. On the third day, therefore, the vizier came with the judges and nobles, who spread a carpet and made the necessary preparations, consisting of incense, rose water, readers of the Koran, and panegyris. When I proceeded with the funeral, I expected none of this, but upon seeing their company I was much gratified. The vizier on this occasion occupied the station of the emperor, defraying every expense and distributing victuals to the poor and others, and giving money to the readers according to the order which he had received from the emperor. After this, the emperor's mother sent for the mother of the child and gave her dresses and ornaments exceeding one thousand dinars in value. She also gave her a thousand dinars in money, and dismissed her on the second day. During the absence of the emperor, the vizier showed me the greatest kindness on the part of himself, as well as on that of his master. 
Soon after, the news of the emperor's approach was received, stating that he was within seven miles of Delhi, and ordering the vizier to come and meet him. He went out accordingly, accompanied by those who had arrived for the purpose of being presented, each taking his present with him. In this manner we proceeded till we arrived at the gate of the palace in which he then was. At this place the secretaries took account of the several presents, and also brought them before the emperor. The presents were then taken away, and the travellers were presented, each according to the order in which he had been arranged. When my turn came, I went in and presented my service in the usual manner, and was very graciously received, the emperor taking my hand and promising me every kindness. To each of the travellers he gave a dress of honour, embroidered with gold, which had been worn by himself, and one of these he also gave to me. After this we met without the palace, and viands were handed about for some time. On this occasion the travellers ate, the vizier with the great emirs standing over them as servants. We then retired. After this the emperor sent to each of us one of the horses of his own stud, adorned and comparisoned with a saddle of silver. He then placed us in his front with the vizier, and rode on till he arrived at his palace in Delhi. On the third day after our arrival, each of the travellers presented himself at the gate of the palace, when the emperor sent to inquire whether there were any among us who wished to take office, either as a writer, a judge, or a magistrate, saying that he would give such appointments. Each of us, of course, gave an answer suitable to his wishes. For my own part, I answered, I have no desire either for rule or writership. But the office both of judge and of magistrate, myself and my fathers, have filled. These replies were carried to the emperor, who commanded each person to be brought before him. And he then gave him such appointment as would suit him, bestowing on him at the same time a dress of honour, and a horse furnished with an ornamented saddle. He also gave him money, appointing likewise the amount of his salary, which was to be drawn from the treasury. He also appointed a portion of the produce of the villages, which each was to receive annually according to his rank. When I was called, I went in and did homage. The vizier said, The Lord of the world appoints you to the office of judge in Delhi. He also gives you a dress of honor with a saddled horse, as also twelve thousand dinars for your present support. He has, moreover, appointed you a yearly salary of twelve thousand dinars, and a portion of lands in the villages which will produce annually an equal sum. I then did homage according to their custom, and withdrew. We shall now proceed to give some account of the Emperor Mohammed, son of Giath Odan Toglik, then of our entering and leaving Hindustan. This emperor was one of the most bountiful and splendidly munificent men where he took, but in other cases one of the most impetuous and inexorable. And very seldom indeed did it happen that pardon followed his anger. On one occasion he took offence at the inhabitants of Delhi, on account of the numbers of its inhabitants who had revolted, and the liberal support which these had received from the rest, and to such a pitch did the quarrel rise, that the inhabitants wrote a letter consisting of several pages, in which they very much abused him. They then sealed it up, and directed it to the real head and lord of the world, adding, Let no other person read it. They then threw it over the gate of the palace. Those who saw it could do no other than send it to him, and he read it accordingly. The consequence was he ordered all the inhabitants to quit the place, and upon some delay being evinced, he made a proclamation stating that what person soever, being an inhabitant of that city, should be found in any of its houses or streets, should receive condign punishment. Upon this they all went out. But his servants, finding a blind man in one of the houses, and a bedridden one in another, the emperor commanded the bedridden man to be projected from a ballista, and the blind one to be dragged by his feet to Dalotabad, which is at the distance of ten days. And he was so dragged, 
but his limbs dropping off by the way, only one of his legs was brought to the place intended, and was then thrown into it, for the order had been that they should go to this place. When I entered Delhi it was almost a desert. Its buildings were very few, in other respects it was quite empty, its houses having been forsaken by its inhabitants. The king, however, had given orders that any one who wished to leave his own city may come and reside there. The consequence was, the greatest city in the world had the fewest inhabitants. Upon a certain occasion, too, the principal of the preachers, who was then keeper of the jewelry, happened to be outwitted by some of the infidel Hindus, who came by night and stole some jewels. For this he beat the man to death with his own hand. Upon another occasion, one of the emirs of Fargana came to pay him a temporary visit. The emperor received him very kindly, and bestowed on him some rich presents. After this the emir had a wish to return, but was afraid the emperor would not allow him to do so. He began therefore to think of flight. Upon this a whisperer gave intimation of his design, and the emir was put to death. The whole of his wealth was then given to the informers, for this is their custom, that when any one gives private intimation of the designs of another, and his information turns out to be true, the person so informed of is put to death, and his property is given to the informer. There was at that time in the city of Kambaya, on the shores of India, a sheikh of considerable power and note, named the Sheikh Ali Hadari, to whom the merchants and seafaring men made many votive offerings. This sheikh was in the habit of making many predictions for them, but when the Kezai Jalal Odan Afghani rebelled against the emperor, it was told him that the Sheikh Hadari had sent for this Kezai Jalal Odan and given him the cap off his own head. Upon this, the emperor set out for the purpose of making war upon the Kezai Jalal Odan, whom he put to flight. He then returned to his palace, leaving behind him and Emir, who should make inquiry respecting others who had joined the Kezai. The inquiry accordingly went on, and those who had done so were put to death. The sheikh was then brought forward, and when it was proved that he had given his cap to the Kezai, he was also slain. The sheikh Had, son of the sheikh Baha Odan Zachariah, was also put to death, on account of some spite which he would rake upon him. This was one of the greatest sheikhs. His crime was that his uncle's son had rebelled against the emperor when he was acting as governor in one of the provinces of India. So war was made upon him, and being overcome, his flesh was roasted with some rice and thrown to the elephants to be devoured, but they refused to touch it. Upon a certain day, when I myself was present, some men were brought out who had been accused of having attempted the life of the vizier. They were ordered accordingly to be thrown to the elephants which had been taught to cut their victims to pieces. Their hooves were cased with sharp iron instruments, and the extremities of these were like knives. On such occasions the elephant driver rode upon them, and when a man was thrown to them they would wrap the trunk about him and toss him up, then take him with the teeth and throw him between their forefeet upon the breast, and do just as the driver should bid them, and according to the orders of the emperor. If the order was to cut him to pieces, the elephant would do so with his irons, and then throw the pieces among the assembled multitude. But if the order was to leave him, he would be left lying before the emperor until the skin should be taken off and stuffed with hay and the flesh given to the dogs. On one occasion, one of the emirs, viz. the Ain al-Mulk, who had the charge of the elephants and beasts of burden, revolted and took away the greater part of these beasts and went over the Ganges. At the time the emperor was on his march towards the Mabar districts against the emir Jalal Odan. Upon this occasion the people of the country proclaimed the runaway emperor, but an insurrection arising, the matter soon came to an end. 
Another of his emirs, namely Halajun, also revolted, and sallied out of Delhi with a large army. The viceroy in the district of Telangana also rebelled and made an effort to obtain the kingdom, and very nearly succeeded, on account of the great number who were then in rebellion, and the weakness of the army of the emperor, for a pestilence had carried off the greater part. From his extreme good fortune, however, he got the victory, collected his scattered troops, and subdued the rebellious emirs, killing some, torturing others, and pardoning the rest. He then returned to his residence, repaired his affairs, strengthened his empire, and took vengeance on his enemies. But let me now return to the account of my own affairs with him. When he had appointed me to the office of judge of Delhi, had made the necessary arrangements, and given me the presents already mentioned, the horses prepared for me, and for the other emirs who were about his person, were sent to each of us, who severally kissed the hoof of the horse of him who brought them, and then led our own to the gate of the palace. We then entered, and each put on a dress of honor, after which we came out, mounted, and returned to our houses. The emperor said to me on this occasion, Do not suppose that our office of judge of Delhi will cost you little trouble. On the contrary, it will require the greatest attention. I understood what he said, but did not return him a good answer. He understood the Arabic, and was not pleased with my reply. I am, said I, of the sect of Ibn Malik, but the people of Delhi follow Hanafi. Besides, I am ignorant of their language. He replied, I have appointed two learned men your deputies, who will advise with you. It will be your business to sign the legal instruments. He then added, If what I have appointed prove not an income sufficient to meet your numerous expenses, I have likewise given you a cell, the bequests appropriated to which you may expend, taking this in addition to what is already appointed. I thanked him for this, and returned to my house. A few days after this he made me a present of twelve thousand dinars. In a short time, however, I found myself involved in great debts, amounting to about fifty-five thousand dinars, according to the computation of India, which with them amounts to five thousand five hundred tankas, but which, according to the computation of the West, will amount to thirteen thousand dinars. The reason of this debt was the great expenses incurred in waiting on the emperor during his journeys to repress the revolt of the Ain el Mulk. About this time I composed a panegyric in praise of the emperor, which I wrote in Arabic and read to him. He translated it for himself and was wonderfully pleased with it, for the Indians are fond of Arabic poetry and are very desirous of it being memorialized in it. I then informed him of the debt I had incurred, which he ordered to be discharged from his own treasury, and said, Take care in future not to exceed the extent of your income. May God reward him. Some time after the emperor's return from the Mebar districts, and his ordering my residence in Delhi, his mind happened to change respecting a sheikh in whom he had placed great confidence, and even visited, and who then resided in a cave without the city. He took him accordingly and imprisoned him, and then interrogated his children as to who had resorted to him. They named the persons who had done so, and myself among the rest, for it happened that I had visited him in the cave. I was consequently ordered to attend at the gate of the palace, and a council to sit within. I attended in this way for four days, and few were those who did so who escaped death. I betook myself, however, to continued fasting, and tasted nothing but water, on the first day I repeated the sentence, God is our support and the most excellent patron, three and thirty thousand times. And after the fourth day, by God's goodness, was I delivered. But the sheikh and all those who had visited him except myself were put to death. Upon this I gave up the office of judge, and bidding farewell to the world, attached myself to the holy and pious sheikh, the saint and phoenix of his age, Kamal Odan Abdul Ula el Ghazai, who had wrought many open miracles. 
All I had I gave to the fakirs, and putting on the tunic of one of them, I attached myself to this sheikh for five months, until I had kept a fast of five continued days. I then breakfasted on a little rice. Chapter 17 Sent on an Embassy to China Embassy from China to the Emperor Gold Mines on the Mountain of Kora Sets out on the Embassy Arrives at Biana, Cool, War with the Hindus, Taken Prisoner, Brought Back to Delhi, Returns to Yuhbura, Merwa, Gwalior, Barun, Account of the Jogis, Witch Burnt, Juggling of the Jogis, Arrives at Kashmara, Chanderi, Description of Gwalior, Daulatabad, Nazarabad, Mahratas, Segar, Kambaya, Goa, Bayram, Kuka, Dankul, Sindabur, Hinar, King of Hinar not subject to the Emperor of Delhi, Malabar customs, Kings of Malabar, Law of Succession, Account of the Growth of Pepper. After this the Emperor sending for me, I went to him in my tunic, and he received me more graciously than ever. He said, It is my wish to send you as ambassador to the Emperor of China, for I know you love traveling in various countries. I consented, and he sent dresses of honor, horses, money, etc., with everything necessary for the journey. The Emperor of China had, at this time, sent presents to the Sultan, consisting of a hundred Mamluks, fifty slave girls, five hundred dresses of El Kamanja, five hundred mounds of musk, five dresses wrought with jewels, five quivers wrought with gold, and five swords set with jewels. His request with the emperor was that he should be permitted to rebuild an idol temple in the country about the mountain of Kora, on which infidel Hindus resided on the top of which and on the heights was a plain of three months' journey, and to which there was no approach. Here, too, resided many infidel Hindu kings. The extremities of these parts extend to the confines of Tibet, where the musk gazelles are found. There are also mines of gold on these mountains, and poisonous grass growing, such that when the rains fall upon it, and run in torrents to the neighboring rivers, no one dares in consequence drink of the water during the time of their rising, and should any one do so, he dies immediately. This idol temple they usually called the Burkana. It stood at the foot of the mountain and was destroyed by the Muslims when they became masters of these parts. Nor were the inhabitants of the mountain in a condition to fight the Mohammedans upon the plain. But the plain was necessary to them for the purposes of agriculture. They had therefore requested the Emperor of China to send presents to the King of India and to ask this favor for them. Besides, to this temple the people of China also made pilgrimages. It was situated in a place called Samhal. The reply of the emperor was that this could not be permitted among a people who were Mohammedans, nor could there exist any church whatsoever in countries subject to them, except only where tribute was paid. But if they chose to do this, their request would be complied with, for the place in which this idol temple was situated had been conquered, and had, in consequence, become a district of the Mohammedans. The emperor also sent presents much more valuable than those he had received, which were these following, namely, one hundred horses of the best breed, saddled and bridled, one hundred Mamluks, one hundred Hindu singing slave girls, one hundred Bairami dresses, the value of each of which was a hundred dinars, one hundred silken dresses, five hundred saffron-colored dresses, one hundred pieces of the best cotton cloth, one thousand dresses of the various clothing of India, with numerous instruments of gold and silver, swords and quivers set with jewels, and ten robes of honor wrought with gold, one of the sultan's own dresses, with various other articles. The emperor appointed the emir Zahir Odan el-Zanjani, one of the ulema, 
with El Fati Kafur, with whom the present was entrusted to accompany me. These were favorite officers with the emperor. He also sent with us a thousand cavalry, who were to conduct us to the place at which we were to take shipping. The servants of the emperor of China, who amounted to about one hundred, and with whom there was a great emir, also returned with us. So we left the presence of the emperor on the seventeenth day of the month Sephar, in the year 743, A.D. 1342, and after a few days arrived at the city of Biana, which is large. We next arrived at Kul, which is a beautiful city, the greatest part of the trees of which are vines. When we had arrived here, we were informed that the infidel Hindus had besieged the city El Jalali, which is seven days from Kul. The intention of these infidels was to destroy the inhabitants, and this they nearly effected. We made such a vigorous attack upon them, however, that not one of them was left alive. But many of our companions suffered martyrdom in the onset, and among them was El Fati Kafur, the person to whom the presence had been confided. We immediately transmitted an account of this affair to the emperor, and waited for his answer. During this interval, whenever any of the infidel Hindus made an attack on the places in the neighborhood of El Jalali, either all or a part of us gave assistance to the Muslims. Upon a certain day, however, I turned into a garden just without the city of Kul, when the heat of the sun was excessive, and while we were in the garden, someone cried out that the Hindus were making an attack upon one of the villages. I accordingly rode off with some of my companions to their assistance. When the infidels saw this, they fled, but the Muslims were so scattered in pursuing them that myself and only five others were left. Some of their people saw this, and the consequence was, a considerable number of cavalry made an attack upon us. When we perceived their strength, we retreated, while they pursued us, and in this we persevered. I observed three of them coming after me when I was left quite alone. It happened at the same time that the forefeet of my horse had stuck fast between two stones, so that I was obliged to dismount and set him at liberty. I was now in a way that led into a valley between two hills, and here I lost sight of the infidels. I was so circumstanced, however, that I knew neither the country nor the roads. I then set my horse at liberty to go where he would. While I was in a valley closely interwoven with trees, behold, a party of cavalry, about forty in number, rushed upon me and took me prisoner, before I was well aware of their being there. I was much afraid they would shoot me with their arrows. I alighted from my horse, therefore, and gave myself up as their prisoner. They then stripped me of all I had, bound me, and took me with them for two days, intending to kill me. Of their language I was quite ignorant, but God delivered me from them, for they left me, and I took my course I knew not whither. I was much afraid they would take it into their heads to kill me. I therefore hid myself in a forest, thickly interwoven with trees and thorns, so much so that a person wishing to hide himself could not be discovered. Whenever I ventured upon the roads I found they always led, either to one of the villages of the infidels, or to some ruined village. I was always, therefore, under the necessity of returning, and thus I passed seven whole days, during which I experienced the greatest horrors. My food was the fruit and leaves of the mountain trees. At the end of the seventh day, however, I got sight of a black man, who had with him a walking staff shod with iron, and a small water vessel. He saluted me, and I returned the salute. He then said, What is your name? I answered, Mohammed. I then asked him his name. He replied, El Kalb El Kari, i.e., the wounded heart. He then gave me some pulse which he had with him, and some water to drink. He asked me whether I would accompany him. I did so, but I soon found myself unable to move, and I sunk on the earth. He then carried me on his shoulders, and as he walked on with me I fell asleep. I awoke, however, about the time of dawn, and found myself at the emperor's palace gate. 
A courier had already brought the news of what had happened, and of my loss, to the emperor, who now asked me of all the particulars, and these I told him. He then gave me ten thousand dinars, and furnished me for my return. He also appointed one of his emirs, El Malik Sambul, to present the gift. So we returned to the city of Kul. From this we proceeded to the city of Yubura, and then descended to the shores of a lake called the Water of Life. After this we proceeded to Kinoj, which is but a small town. Here I met the aged Sheikh Sali of Fargana. He was at this time sick. He told me that he was then one hundred and fifty years old. I was informed that he would constantly fast, and that for many successive days. We next arrived at the city of Merwa, which is a large place, inhabited for the most part by infidels who pay tribute to the emperor. We next arrived at the city of Kaliur, which is large, and which has a fortress on the top of a high mountain. In this the emperor imprisons those of whom he entertains any fear. We next arrived at the city of Barun, which is small and inhabited by Muslims. It is situated in the midst of the infidel districts. In these parts are many wild beasts, which enter the town and tear the inhabitants. I was told, however, that such as enter the streets of the town are not wild beasts really, but only some of the magicians, called jogis, who can assume the shape of wild beasts and appear as such to the mind. These are a people who can work miracles, of which one is that any one of them can keep an entire fast for several months. Many of them will dig houses for themselves underground, over which any one may build, leaving them only a place for the air to pass through. In this the jogi will reside for months without eating or drinking anything. I heard that one of them remained thus for a whole year. I saw, too, in the city of Janjarur, one of the Muslims who had been taught by them, and who had set up for himself a lofty cell like an obelisk. Upon the top of this he stood for five and twenty days, during which time he neither ate nor drank. In this situation I left him, nor do I know how long he continued there, after I had left the place. People say that they mix certain seeds, one of which is destined for a certain number of days or months, and that they stand in need of no other support during all this time. They also foretell events. The Emperor of Hindustan very much respects them, and occasionally sits in their company. Some of them will eat nothing but herbs, and it is clear from their circumstances that they accustom themselves to abstinence, and feel no desire either for the world or its show. Some of them will kill a man with a look, but this is most frequently done by the women. The woman who can do so is termed a goftar, it happened when I was judge of Delhi, and the emperor was upon one of his journeys that a famine took place. On this occasion the emperor ordered that the poor should be divided among the nobles for support, until the famine should cease. My portion, as affixed by the vizier, amounted to five hundred. These I sustained in a house which I built for the purpose— on a certain day during this time a number of them came to me, bringing a woman with them, who, as they said, was a goftar, and had killed a child which happened to be near her. I sent her, however, to the vizier, who ordered four large water vessels to be filled with water and tied to her. She was then thrown into the great river, the Jumna. She did not sink in the water, but remained unhurt, so that they knew that she was a goftar. The vizier then ordered her to be burnt, which was done, and the people distributed her ashes among themselves, believing that if any one would fumigate himself with them, he would be secure from the fascinations of a goftar for that year. But if she had sunk, they would have taken her out of the water, for then they would have known that she was not a goftar. I was once in the presence of the emperor of Hindustan, when two of these jogis, wrapped up in cloaks, with their heads covered, for they take out all their hairs, both of their heads and armpits, with powder, came in. 
the emperor caressed them and said pointing to me this is a stranger show him what he has never yet seen they said we will one of them then assumed the form of a cube and arose from the earth and in this cubic shape he occupied a place in the air over our heads i was so much astonished and terrified at this that i fainted and fell to the earth the emperor then ordered me some medicine which he had with him and upon taking this i recovered and sat up this cubic figure still remaining in the air just as it had been his companion then took a sandal belonging to one of those who had come out with him and struck it upon the ground as if he had been angry the sandal then ascended until it became opposite in situation with the cube it then it then struck it upon the neck and the cube descended gradually to the earth and at last rested in the place which it had left the emperor then told me that the man who took the form of a cube was a disciple to the owner of the sandal and continued he had i not entertained fears for the safety of thy intellect i should have ordered them to show thee greater things than these from this, however, I took a palpitation at the heart, until the emperor ordered me a medicine which restored me. We then proceeded from the city of Barun to the stage of Kajwara, at which there is a lake about a mile in length, and round this are temples in which there are idols. At this place resides a tribe of jogis, with long and clotted hair. Their color inclines to yellow, which arises from their fasting many of the muslims of these parts attend on them and learn magic from them we next came to the city of jenderi which is large after this to that of tahar between which and delhi is a distance of twenty-four days and from which leaves of the betel nut are carried to delhi from this place we went to the city of ajbal then to dolatabad which is a place of great splendor and not inferior to delhi the lieutenancy of Dolatabad extends through a distance of three months. Its citadel is called El Dawagir. It is one of the greatest and strongest forts in India. It is situated on the top of a rock which stands in the plain. The extremities are depressed so that a rock appears elevated like a milestone, and upon this the fort is built. In it is a ladder made of hides, and this is taken up by night and let down by day. In this fortress the emperor imprisons such persons as have been guilty of serious crimes. The emir of Dalatabad had been tutor to the emperor. He is the great emir Katlukan. In this city are vines and pomegranates which bear fruit twice in the year. It is, moreover, one of the greatest districts as to revenue. Its yearly taxes and fines amount to seventeen karors. A karor is one hundred lakh, and a lakh one hundred thousand Indian dinars. This was collected by a man appointed to do so before the government of Katlukan, but as he had been killed on account of the treasure which was with him and this taken out of his effects after his death the government fell to katlukan the most beautiful market-place here is called the tarab abad in the shops of which sit the singing women ready dressed out with their slave girls in attendance over these is an emir whose particular business it is to regulate their income we next came to the city of nazar abad it is small and inhabited by the Mahratas, a people well skilled in the arts, medicine, and astrology. Their nobles are Brahmins. The food of the Mahratas consists of rice, green vegetables, and oil of sesame. They do not allow either the punishing or sacrificing of animals. They carefully wash all their food, just as one washes after other impurities and never intermarry with their relations unless separated by the intervals of seven generations at least they also abstain from the use of urine our next place of arrival was the city of sagar which is large and is situated on a river of the same name near it are mills which are worked for their orchards i e to supply water the inhabitants of this place are religious and peaceable 
We next arrived at the city of Cambea, which is situated at a mouth of the sea which resembles a valley, and into which the ships ride. Here also the flux and reflux of the tide is felt. The greatest part of its inhabitants are foreign merchants. We next came to Goa, which is subject to the infidel king Jalansi, king of Kandahar, who is also subject to the emperor of Hindustan, and to whom he sends an annual present. We next came to a large city situated at a mouth of the sea, and from this we took shipping and came to the island of Bayram, which is without inhabitants. We next arrived at the city of Kuka, the king of which is an infidel named Dankul, and subject to the emperor of Hindustan. After some days we came to the island of Sindabur, in the interior of which are six and thirty villages. By this we passed, however, and dropped anchor at a small island near it, in which is a temple and a tank of water. On this island we landed, and here I saw a jogi leaning against the wall of the temple, and placed between two idols. He had some marks about him of a religious warfare. I addressed him, but he gave me no answer. We looked to, but could see no food near him. When we looked at him, he gave a loud shout, and a coconut fell upon him from a tree that was there. This nut he threw to us. To me he threw ten dinars after I had offered him a few, of which he would not accept. I supposed him to be a Muslim, for when I addressed him he looked towards heaven, and then towards the temple at Mecca, intimating that he acknowledged God, and believed in Mohammed as his prophet. We next came to the city of Hinar, which is situated at an estuary of the sea, and which receives large vessels. The inhabitants of this place are Muslims of the sect of Shafia, a peaceable and religious people. They carry on, however, a warfare for the faith by sea, and for this they are noted. The women of this city, and indeed of all the Indian districts situated on the seashores, never dress in clothes that have been stitched, but the contrary. One of them, for example, will tie one part of a piece of cloth round her waist while the remaining part will be placed upon her head and breast. They are chaste and handsome. The greater part of the inhabitants, both male and females, have committed the Koran to memory. The inhabitants of Malabar generally pay tribute to the king of Hinaur, fearing as they do his bravery by sea. His army, too, consists of about six thousand men. They are nevertheless a brave and warlike race. The present king is Jamal Odan Muhammad ibn Hassan. He is one of the best of princes, but is himself subject to an infidel king whose name is Horeb. We next came into the country of Malabar, which is the country of black pepper. Its length is a journey of two months along the shore from Sindabur to Kaulam. The whole of the way by land lies under the shade of trees, and at the distance of every half mile there is a house made of wood in which there are chambers fitted up for the reception of comers and goers, whether they be Muslims or infidels. To each of these there is a well, out of which they drink, and over each is an infidel appointed to give drink. To the infidels he supplies this in vessels, to the Muslims he pours it in their hands. They do not allow the Muslims to touch their vessels or to enter into their apartments, but if anyone should happen to eat out of one of their vessels they break it to pieces. But in most of their districts the Muslim merchants have houses and are greatly respected, so that Muslims who are strangers, whether they are merchants or poor, may lodge among them. But at any town in which no Muslim resides, upon anyone's arriving they cook, and pour out drink for him upon the leaf of the banana, and whatever he happens to give is given to the dogs. And in all this space of two months' journey there is not a span free from cultivation, for everybody has here a garden, and his house is placed in the middle of it, and round the whole of this there is a fence of wood, up to which the ground of each inhabitant comes. No one travels in these parts upon beasts of burden, nor is there any horse found, except with the king, who is therefore the only person who rides. 
when however any merchant has to sell or buy goods they are carried upon the backs of men who are always ready to do so for hire Every one of these men has a long staff which is shod with iron at its extremity and at the top has a hook. When therefore he is tired with his burden, he sets up his staff in the earth like a pillar and places the burden upon it. And when he has rested, he again takes up his burden without the assistance of another. With one merchant you will see one or two hundred of these carriers, the merchant himself walking, but when the nobles pass from place to place, they ride in a jula made of wood, something like a box, and which is carried upon the shoulders of slaves and hirelings. They put a thief to death for stealing a single nut, or even a grain of seed of any fruit. Hence thieves are unknown among them, and should anything fall from a tree, none except its proper owner would attempt to touch it. In the country of Malabar are twelve kings, the greatest of whom has fifty thousand troops at his command, the least five thousand or thereabouts. That which separates the district of one king from that of another is a wooden gate upon which is written, The gate of safety of such an one. For when any criminal escapes from the district of one king and gets safely into that of another, he is quite safe, so that no one has the least desire to take him so long as he remains there. Each of their kings succeeds to rule as being sister's son, not the son to the last. Their country is that from which black pepper is brought, and this is the far greater of their produce and culture. The pepper tree resembles that of the dark grape. They plant it near that of the coconut, and make framework for it, just as they do for the grape tree. It has, however, no tendrils, and the tree itself resembles a bunch of grapes. The leaves are like the ears of a horse, but some of them resemble the leaves of a bramble. When the autumn arrives, it is ripe. They then cut it and spread it, just as they do grapes, and thus it is dried by the sun. As to what some have said, that they boil it in order to dry it, it is without foundation. I also saw in their country, and on the seashores, aloes, like the seed aloe, sold by measure, just as meal and millet is. Chapter 18 Arrival at Abisardar, Kakanwar, Manjarun, Mohammedan Merchants Here, Hili, Jerkanan, Dadkanan, Miraculous Tree, Fatan, Fandarena, Calicut, Chinese junks, embassy goes on board and is wrecked, proceeds to Kaulam after his property, arrives at Kanjarkara, returns to Calicut, joins an expedition against Sindabur, the place carried by assault, arrives at Hinaur, Fakenaur, Manjarur, Hili, Jarafatan, Badafatan, Fandarena, Shaliat, returns to Sindabur, and sets out for the Maldive Islands. The first town we entered in the country of Malabar was that of Abisardar, which is small, and is situated on a large estuary of the sea. We next came to the city of Kakanwar, which is large, and also upon an estuary of the sea. It abounds in the sugar cane. The sultan is an infidel. He sent his son as a pledge to our vessel, and we landed accordingly and were honorably received. He also sent presents to the ship as marks of respect to the Emperor of India. It is a custom with them that every vessel which passes by one of their ports shall enter it, and give a present to its sultan. In this case they let it pass, but otherwise they make war upon it with their vessels. They then board it out of contempt and impose a double fine upon the cargo, just in proportion to the advantage they usually gain from merchants entering their country. We next arrived at the city of Majaroon, which is situated upon a large estuary of the sea called the Estuary of the Wolf, and which is the greatest estuary in the country of Malabar. In this place are some of the greatest merchants of Persia and Yemen. Ginger and black pepper are here in great abundance. 
The king of this place is the greatest of the kings of Malabar, and in it are about four thousand Mohammedan merchants. The king made us land and sent us a present. We next came to the town of Hili, which is large and situated upon an estuary of the sea. As far as this place come the ships of China, but they do not go beyond it, nor do they enter any harbor except that of this place, of Calicut and of Kaolam. The city of Hili is much revered both by the Mohammedans and infidels, on account of a mosque, the source of light and of blessings which is found in it. To this seafaring persons make and pray their vows, whence its treasury is derived, which is placed under the control of the principal Moslem. The mosque maintains a preacher, and has within it several students, as well as readers of the Koran and persons who teach writing. We next arrived at the city of Jerkanan, the king of which is one of the greatest on these coasts, we next came to Dadkanan, which is a large city abounding with gardens and situated upon a mouth of the sea. In this are found the betel leaf and nut, the coconut and colocasia. Without the city is a large pond for retaining water, about which are gardens. The king is an infidel. His grandfather, who had become Mohammedan, built its mosque and made the pond. The cause of the grandfather's receiving Islamism was a tree, over which he had built the mosque. This tree is a very great wonder. Its leaves are green and like those of the fig, except only that they are soft. The tree is called Daract Shahadet, the tree of testimony, Daract meaning tree. I was told in these parts that this tree does not generally drop its leaves, but at the season of autumn in every year, one of them changes its color, first to yellow, then to red, and that upon this is written with the pen of power, There is no God but God, Muhammad is the prophet of God, and that this leaf alone falls. Very many Mohammedans who were worthy of belief told me this, and said that they had witnessed its fall, and had read the writing, and further that every year at the time of the fall credible persons among the Mohammedans, as well as others of the infidels, sat beneath the tree waiting for the fall of the leaf, and when this took place, that the one half was taken by the Mohammedans as a blessing, and for the purpose of curing their diseases, and the other by the king of the infidel city, and laid up in his treasury as a blessing, and that this is constantly received among them. Now the grandfather of the present king could read the Arabic. He witnessed, therefore, the fall of the leaf, read the inscription, and, understanding its import, became a Mohammedan accordingly. At the time of his death he appointed his son, who was a violent infidel, to succeed him. This man adhered to his own religion, cut down the tree, tore up its roots, and effaced every vestige of it. After two years the tree grew, and regained its original state, and in this it now is. This king died suddenly, and none of his infidel descendants since his time has done anything to the tree. We next came to the city of Fatan, Patan, the greater part of the inhabitants of which are Brahmins, who are held in great estimation among the Hindus. In this place there was not one Mohammedan, Without it was a mosque to which the Mohammedan strangers resort. It is said to have been built by certain merchants, and afterwards to have been destroyed by one of the Brahmins, who had removed the roof of it to his own house. On the following night, however, this house was entirely burnt, and in it the Brahmin, his followers, and all his children. They then restored the mosque, and in future abstained from injuring it, whence it became the resort of the Mohammedan strangers. After this we came to the city of Fandaraina, a beautiful and large place, abounding with gardens and markets. In this the Mohammedans have three districts, each of which is a mosque, with a judge and preacher. We next came to Calicut, one of the great ports of the district of Malabar, and in which merchants from all parts are found. The king of this place is an infidel, who shaves his chin just as the Hadari fakirs of Rome do. 
When we approached this place, the people came out to meet us, and with a large concourse brought us into the port. The greatest part of the Mohammedan merchants of this place are so wealthy that one of them can purchase the whole freightage of such vessels as put in here, and fit out others like them. Here we waited three months for the season to set sail for China, for there is only one season in the year in which the Sea of China is navigable. Nor then is the voyage undertaken except in vessels of the three descriptions following. The greatest is called a junk, the middling sized a zaw, the least a kakam. The sails of these vessels are made of cane reeds, woven together like a mat, which, when they put into port, they leave standing in the wind. In some of these vessels there will be employed a thousand men, six hundred of these sailors, and four hundred soldiers. Each of the larger ships is followed by three others, a middle-sized, a third, and a fourth-sized. These vessels are nowhere made except in the city of El Zaitun in China, or in Sain Kailan, which is Sain El Sain. They row in these ships with large oars, which may be compared to great mass, over some of which five and twenty men will be stationed, who work standing. The commander of each vessel is a great emir. In the large ships, too, they sow garden herbs and ginger, which they cultivate in cisterns made for that purpose, and placed on the sides of them. In these also are houses constructed of wood, in which the higher officers reside with their wives, but these they do not hire out to the merchants. Every vessel, therefore, is like an independent city. Of such ships as these, Chinese individuals will sometimes have large numbers, and generally the Chinese are the richest people in the world. Now, when the season for setting out had arrived, the emperor of Hindustan appointed one of the junks, of the thirteen that were in the port for our voyage. El Malik Sambul, therefore, who had been commissioned to present the gift, and Zahir Odan went on board, and to the former was the present carried. I also sent my baggage, servants, and slave girls on board, but was told by one of them before I could leave the shore that the cabin which had been assigned to me was so small that it would not take the baggage and slave girls. I went therefore to the commander who said, There is no remedy for this. If you wish to have a larger, you had better get into one of the kekams, third-sized vessels. There you will find larger cabins and such as you want. I accordingly ordered my property to be put into the kekam. This was in the afternoon of Thursday, and I myself remained on shore for the purpose of attending divine service on the Friday. During the night, however, the sea arose when some of the junks struck upon the shore, and the greatest part of those on board were drowned, and the rest were saved by swimming. Some of the junks, too, sailed off, and what became of them I know not. The vessel in which the present was stowed kept on the sea till morning, when it struck on the shore, and all on board perished, and the wealth was lost." I had indeed seen from the shore the emperor's servants, with El Malik Sambul and Zahir Odan, prostrating themselves almost distracted, for the terror of the sea was such as not to be got rid of. I myself had remained on shore, having with me my prostration carpet and ten dinars, which had been given me by some holy men. These I kept as a blessing, for the kakam had sailed off with my property and followers. The missionaries of the king of China were on board another junk, which struck upon the shore also. Some of them were saved and brought to land, and afterwards clothed by the Chinese merchants. I was told that the kakam in which my property was must have put into Kaolam. I proceeded therefore to that place by the river. It is situated at the distance of ten days from Calicut. About five days I came to Kanjakara, which stands on the top of a hill, is inhabited by Jews, and governed by an emir who pays tribute to the king of Kaolam. All the trees we saw upon the banks of this river, as well as upon the seashores, were those of the cinnamon and bakam, which constitute the fuel of the inhabitants. And with this we cooked our food. 
Upon the tenth day we arrived at Kaulam, which is the last city on the Malabar coast. In this place is a large number of Mohammedan merchants, but the king is an infidel. In this place I remained a considerable time, but heard nothing of the Kakam and my property. I was afraid to return to the emperor, who would have said, How came you to leave the present and stay upon the shore? For I knew what sort of a man he was in cases of this kind. I also advised with some of the Mohammedans, who dissuaded me from returning, and said, He will condemn you because you left the present. You had better, therefore, return by the river to Calicut. I then betook myself to Jamal Odan, king of Hinaur, by sea, who, when I came near, met me and received me honorably, and then appointed me a house with a suitable maintenance. He was about to attend on divine service in the mosque and commanded me to accompany him. I then became attached to the mosque and read daily a katma or two. At this time the king was preparing an expedition against the island of Sindabur, for this purpose he had prepared two and fifty vessels, which, when ready, he ordered me to attend with him for the expedition. Upon this occasion I opened the Koran in search of an omen, and in the first words of the first leaf which I laid my hand upon was frequent mention of the name of God, and the promise that he would certainly assist those who assisted him. I was greatly delighted with this, and when the king came to the evening prayer, I told him of it, and requested to be allowed to accompany him. He was much surprised at the omen, and prepared to set out in person. After this he went on board one of the vessels, taking me with him, and then we sailed. When we got to the island of Sindabur, we found the people prepared to resist us, and a hard battle was accordingly fought. We carried the place, however, by divine permission, by assault. After this the king gave me a slave girl, with clothing and other necessaries, and I resided with him some months. I then requested permission to make a journey to Kaulam, to inquire after the Kakam with my goods. He gave me permission, after obtaining a promise that I would return to him. I then left him for Hintar, and then proceeded to Fakanor, and thence to Manjaror, thence to Hili, Jarafatan, Badafatan, Fandarena, and Calicut, mention of which has already been made. I next came to the city of Shaliat, where the Shaliats are made, and hence they derive their name. This is a fine city. I remained at it some time, and there heard that the Kekam had returned to China, and that my slave girl had died in it, and I was very much distressed on her account. The infidels, too, had seized upon my property, and my followers had been dispersed among the Chinese and others. I then returned to Sindabur to the king Jamal Odan, at the time when an infidel king was besieging the town with his troops. I left the place, therefore, and made for the Baldive Islands, at which, after ten days, I arrived. End of section 7